Hello. This week on Book 4, we have a paperback review from Sean French and first, an interview with Geoffrey Grigston, who has no less than eight books out this autumn in hardback and paperback. Poet, anthologist, editor, naturalist, historian and critic, Geoffrey Grigston has been a rough diamond or thorn in the flesh of British literary life for over five decades. Now 79, he was born and grew up in Cornwall when it still felt like the 19th century. His love of that countryside and of Wiltshire, where he's lived since the 1930s, has inspired many of his poems and his splendid shell guides to Britain. That passion for English places and things goes with his enthusiasm for painters such as Samuel Palmer, Ben Nicholson and George Stubbs, for rural poets like John Clare, William Barnes and George Crabbe, and for odd rich corners of English literature, which he's collected in his many anthologies, including Before the Romantics and, most recently, The Faber Book of Reflective Verse. But there's another side to Geoffrey Grigson, and that's the pugnacious urban critic. He greatly admired Wyndham Lewis, an independent and belligerent writer. It was very much under his influence that Geoffrey Grigson founded and edited New Verse from 1933 to 1939. Here, he promoted his heroes, W. H. Auden and Louis McNeese, for their exact material view of things and their explicit recipes for being human. New Verse attacked what Grigson considered to be mannerism, esotericism, eclecticism and fraud. Among others, the work of Edith Sitwell, Ezra Pound and John Betjeman came under his lash. He's just published his Recollections and, at the same time, a private art, his poetry notebook, and Blessings, Kicks and Curses, his aptly named collections of reviews, have just come out in paperback. In these volumes, he attacks some old and new targets, including academics, Americans, little magazines, poetry critics and literary fashions, and celebrates some new and old enthusiasms and friendships. We went to talk to him at his farmhouse in Wiltshire, where he lives with his wife, the cookery writer Jane Grigson, and we began by asking him about the sources of his poetry. In your 1939 preface to New Verse, to the New Verse anthology, you said that poets should report well, begin with objects and events. And I wanted to ask you, what are the objects and things and places which you began with in your poetry? I rather suspect the childhood ones, really. Miscellaneous childhood ones of almost every kind. Can you give me an example of, of a childhood experience that's come into a, a poem? Um, yes. Uh, I think it's come into a poem. In the valley in my village in Cornwall, my parish in Cornwall, in the spring, it started to rain like the devil. And then the sun came out, and uh, sycamore stems were glittering. It's absolutely wonderful. And I've never forgotten it, and it, you know, it comes back again after years. And it must be 50 years ago. Do you think of yourself as a rural poet, writing in a tradition of uh, rural poetry, of English rural poetry? I'm thinking of Hardy or of Edward Thomas. Yes, I, I don't like the idea of being a rural poet. I mean, I, I think um, I think everything is can possibly go into a poem. It may be rural, it may be a painting by Andre Bouchon, it may be a Ben Nicholson or something of that kind. Maybe something quite different or uh, something one's picked up from reading uh, archaeological books and... Uh, like. I mean, I think, I think it's, um, it'd be too confined. I don't think, I, I wouldn't call Hardy a rural poet. I think it's been rather pushed on to Hardy, really. Uh, he's a life and death poem, poet, all right, but, but not a rural one, except that, you know, he, he lives more in the country than he does in the town on the whole, and so those experiences come easier to him. Do you think that's a narrowing definition of poetry, then? I don't like it when it's applied to me. <laughs> I mean, who, 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 one has to apply to practically everybody, every poet one really likes. But you do use earth and 
cress and rocks and moss and stars and uh, rain and weather and things like that a lot, don't you? Yes, well, they're all around us the whole time. Um, one can't avoid them. I mean, you know, they, they press on one's life or they entertain one's life or they depress one's life. Rock. Essential is rock. In its extrusions, let it not be too soft and friable, so too slatternly. Also, let it not be chalk, with that I am not at home. Let it not be, as a rule, too hard, too rough, too resistant of hard frost. Granite, though not basalt, I refuse. For preference, let it release water, admit roots, breed flowers. Could I go back to New Verse, which I mentioned to start with? What did you want to do in New Verse when you, when you started it? Well, New Verse came at a very interesting moment. Um, I could find a better word than interesting, no doubt. The Georgian poetry, that rather sort of feeble, natural, really natural poetry, uh, leaning over the gate and looking at a galloping lamb and so on, was, was fading away. And there was clearly, uh, with poets like Louis McNeese and, uh, and Orton, something quite different and something much more universal coming, universal in particular, and it wasn't well received. Oh, there were people, you know, he, he was nobody, he was nothing, he was obscure, he was this, he was that. Oh, and they had this feeling, what with uh, painters and, uh, and writers, that one wanted a magazine, however small, which, which, um, however combative, and he needed to be combative, to make room for them. You published a lot of Auden. Uh, what was it especially that you admired about Auden? Well, in one sense, he was racy. You know, he put things into poems which weren't poetical, and which became poetical because he put them in the poems. I, I, I think that was the great point, and the great point of freshness and so on. And then, uh, somewhere Wyndham Lewis, talking about Auden, said that uh, he'd, whereas Eliot had been uh, rather on the dry side, if not on the dry side, on the verbally mean side, you know, he didn't waste much, and that Auden had come with a loosened tongue. Do you think that uh, Wyndham Lewis and Auden and McNeese um, uh, were, were better modernist writers than, say, Eliot, the late Eliot or, or Pound? Do you think that there's a sort of division between the modernist writers you admire and the ones you think had a rather baleful effect? Well, one always likes the ones one comes on first, but even so, I think that, I think that that's true. I mean, I... Uh, I find Pound the, the most extraordinary um, error of Eliot. I mean, I think he's such a, on the whole, such a worthless and useless poet that it, 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 it puzzles me very, very much. And um, uh, Wyndham Lewis always used to say that after the, after the Wasteland and the Hollow Men, uh, Eliot never wrote a good poem, and I... I something to be said for it, I think. I mean, as soon as somebody gets deified in his lifetime, almost anything can be, that he writes can be accepted. I mean, you can't, he doesn't get, a, he doesn't get neglected, so. But you don't think that the four quartets, for instance, are fine poems? Uh, they aren't as interesting as the Wasteland and the Hollow Men, anyway. And I'm sure that, uh, it's things from the wasteland that stick in one's mind and in one's memory. 
You've made a lot of anthologies. What have you wanted to do in your anthologies? What have your principles been as, as an anthologizer? If I was cynical, I'd say making some money, <laughs> because, you, you know, you have to make money. But you, you, you fall in love with certain poems and certain poets, and you do want to make them better known. And, of course, one knows that most people's poetry reading comes from anthologies. I mean, they don't settle down and read uh, a long amount of collected works. They pick her and they pick there according to their need and according to their mood. And as you say, some people go get into an oblivion which isn't deserved. And my goodness, it's nice plucking them out of it. Do you think that this business of calling poets minor and major is always rather foolish? Well, it is rather foolish, really, isn't it? I, I mean, major is one thing, but otherwise there are poets, and, and if, a, if he's a good poet, he's a good poet. I mean, things go by fashion, of course. How do you account for fashion? What do you think God, makes, makes literary fashions? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's, very, it's a great mystery, isn't it? Mm. Now, I'll tell you an example, and that is James Elroy Flecker, who incidentally was uh, uh, just his centenary. Just gone. Well, he's a very good poet, within limits. I mean, he, he's not a great philosophic poet, or that, but he's a wonderful, melodious poet. But you, people go on reading him, but they never talk about him anymore. No, I suppose he died young. It's a good, dangerous thing to die young. Whatever people say, God's love die young, they don't. I mean, it's, it's a great mistake to... <laughs> it's a great mistake to die young. If you take all your work together, your anthologies, your poetry, your literary criticism, do you think of it as a kind of manifesto, as a sort of polemical argument about what literature ought to be? In a way, yes, though I would like to... Um, Love the polemical, <laughs> the polemical reputation. But it, it is, in a sense, a, a manifesto. But then it, one's existence, if one's a writer, is a manifesto. Isn't it really? It's what one's doing. I... What does the manifesto say? What does the, the, Greeks, the Grigson manifesto say? I don't know what the Grigson manifesto says, but it... Um, He talks a good deal about the heart, I think, and about, and uh, for want of a better word, about love and love poetry, and, and regret for a love that's over, or a love that's faded out, or, or death at times, yes. Now, there's one, one poem of mine which I, which ends with um, uh, about uh, a funeral in the Cotswolds and saying that the, uh, the old people at the funeral are really mourning themselves. Not so much the actual man, but they're mourning themselves and they're mourning, they're mourning the, uh, the loss of the sparkle of life and tenderness. Looking at all your work, and especially looking at your most recent poems, it's evident that you you think a lot about mortality. Yes, I do. Oh, because mortality is the end of glitter, it's the end of love, and uh, it's the end of... I hate the word love, but uh, we, what can one do? Um, uh, it's the end, it's the end of things, and I dislike the thought of the end. But do you think that thinking about mortality in fact enhances the, uh, the right uh, sense of <laughs> the glitter? Yes, I do. Yes, and it's uh, decidedly. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, the way of celebrating, celebrating its opposite. With regret. With regret. Is swan. Remote music of his swans, their long necks ahead of them, slow beating of their wings in unison, traversing serene, grey, wide, blended horizontals of endless sea and sky. 
their choral song. Heard sadly, but not sad. They sing with solemnity, yet cheerfully, contentedly, though one by one they die, one by one. His white birds falter and fall out of the sky. You're still quite fierce, though. That passion and, and enthusiasm um, and uh, d desire to get away from the ordinary uh, has run you into quite a lot of uh, fierce quarrels and, and feuds. And someone referred to you as the Thocytes of, of literary journalism once. Now, do you think this is, this is fair, that this association with you, with sort of fierceness and, and crossness? I, I find it rather sad, and I, I admit it's my own fault, really. Then you see, who, whoever lived by writing poems knows he was a bad poet. Uh, Yeats, I think, said that he never in any one year of his life as a poet made more than 250 pounds. Well, you've got to do something. And so, and um, you've got to sort of uh, draw attention, not perhaps to yourself, but to... to it, 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 it's really sort of no good sitting back. And this one is an absolutely a superb, brilliant poet. One must uh, make what the money as one can. But you say uh, that you perhaps slightly regret the extent to which a new verse, for instance, was what you call a malignant egg. <laughs> yes, I, I, I would cross out malignant, I think, now, because it wasn't really malignant at all, except that it... Uh, it had a lot of targets. It had a lot of targets, yes. I, that I, 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 I agree. But, and, um, and you'd stand by those targets? Actually, as targets, yes. I don't stand by the targeting so much. <laughs> I mean, I should have, you know, let the dead bury the dead a bit more, let the slack... leave it alone in the hopes that people come to their senses eventually. Perhaps so. Too much is remembered. It is time more was forgotten. Let these peacocks outside Warwick Castle yell, peck and display cinnamon, blue, green, black and grey. And that will do for today. It is time for more to be covered in deep soil and to sink. It is time for rather less to be printed or scattered through air. Time for more to be written again by hand in black ink. Too much is found. It is time to tread, not to dig. Let much more be lost through holes in our cotton pockets. More spent on sherbet and on the quick transients of Roman candles and rockets. Too much is told. Banish polymath Steiners and 77 other bright British shiners. Naturalists, archaeologists, publishers of publication in parts, Norman Mailer and all long-winded farts. To an artificial, not too get atable or too satellite isle, at least for a while beyond the blind side of the moon, and for our health, and your muse's health, O oh, strictest Apollo, may it be soon. I don't, I think, regret having praised many bad poetry, many bad poems. I, I hope I haven't, anyway. And, you're, and you don't take back anything? No, um, beyond what I've said, I don't take, I don't take, I don't take back uh, uh, praise anyhow. Yes. I may take, yes, I think not. Maybe I don't take back some blame and be a bit more generous. But I don't think that, I don't think that literature's got any room for generosity. It, it's, it's, it's much too uh, serious a matter. I, I hate saying serious, but it's much too grand and good a matter to, 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 to frivol with. Geoffrey Grigson, thank you very much. Geoffrey Grigson's Recollections are published by Chateau and Windus.
and Alison and Busby are reissuing his poetry and criticism.